I now wanted to take a moment to introduce three dynamic women to speak next in three back-to-back -back micro lectures, Dr. Gina Perez Barron, Dr. Yi Chin Ong, and Dr. Yana Vox. And each of these talented women has their own story and will share wisdom and inspiration with us. And then we will uh, have question and answer to follow as well. So first we welcome Dr. Gina Perez Barron. Before I get started, I just, I think that we all should just stop. Um, that is the most incredible story of serving the underserved and taking that to a level that, um, that we rarely see. And I just, wow. Just wow. Uh, okay. Well, that went fast. Um, it's been 17 years since graduation, and I'm sure everyone thinks this, but our class was glorious. Um, our entering class had the highest percentage of Chicanos in um, any entering class in the US in 2001. This year, we lost one, Ana Miranda Maldonado. She was passionate, funny, a mother, a poet, she was my friend. I got mad at her once because she told me that I was always finding something to save. I wish she were here to see that I'm finally learning to save myself. This is for you, Anna. So I left medical school with a plan to live my personal statement to work in our own third world, to be for my patients what I'd always needed, a champion. For 16 years, I worked in federally qualified health centers, tribal clinics, rural and urban health, a maximum security prison. I treated emotional trauma in all its forms with a doctor bag full of a vision from Stanford, skills from residency, humanism from Dr. Wolf, and a fierce drive to help patients turn straw into gold. I learned how to treat addiction in residency with buprenorphine, MAT, medication-assisted treatment. Patients became a country song played backwards. You got your job back, your truck back, your dog back. <laughs> In New Mexico, MAT um, hadn't really made it to the rural areas. Heroin was everywhere, but tecatos, what, what we called them, were despised. I brought my skills to a small mining town um, north of Taos and quickly found that what I'd learned um, didn't work for folks like me. A native, Chicano, poor, working class. So I created a new model. I called it the alchemy uh, model. And for its time and its place, um, it really was revolutionary. My alchemy groups fo focused on the root of addiction, which for my patients was trauma. We aggressively treated cravings as well as the comorbidities that drive addiction. I told them nothing was wrong with them and then connected the dots between their addiction and the lived experiences of historical and intergenerational trauma boarding schools, land grabs, colonization, and cultural genocide. I could relate. My mom, Mexican and Apache, 
had been raised in 50 foster homes from the time she was two until she was 18. She's a miracle. She's given her best. And like all trauma, what we don't heal, we hand down. Alchemy was as much community as treatment, as much classroom as clinic. Most patients didn't have their GED. Now they were learning about neurotransmitters and neuroplasticity. We were teaching epigenetics, attachment styles, and the biopsychosocial model of medicine. We taught dialectical behavioral techniques, cognitive um, distortions, distress tolerance, self-regulation. And they learned about adverse childhood experiences, calculated their own ACE score, and then, like me, marveled to be here. We saw relapse as part of recovery, a call for more treatment. You might use, but you couldn't lie about it because you can't treat a mask. But most powerfully is we held in parity la cultura cura, just as important even more so, was the medicine of our grandmothers. Culture, ceremony, spirit. Their root wisdom, passed down to our blood and our bones of relationship, reciprocity, respect, resilience, responsibility. Patients learned whatever they had gone through, whatever their trauma, their roots remained untouched, completely whole. And their roots said, your joy matters, your balance matters, your life matters. It worked. <laughs> Courts began sending us their most challenging offenders. Grandmas brought their grandchildren. Whole families came. But the more success that we had in the trenches, the more obstacles we faced. Over and over, my program seemed to lose its footing over fundamental breakdowns, both in the system and in its leaders. I'm going to share just one example. In 2017, I merged Alchemy with a floundering community um, mental health agency. I was quickly running groups, seeing 40 patients a day, had a small but mighty team. And the agency continued to struggle. Time and again, <laughs> I let the CEO hold my paychecks so I could make payroll and we could keep our program running. Turns out he'd mismanaged funds. When the state broke the news, they chained our clinic door shut. After that, to keep my patients well, I was seeing them in the back of a van until the van was gone. There was nowhere to take my program. I never got paid. It was a really, really dark time. My friend Jaime, dragged me to Mexico City, and he took me to the top of Teotihuacan. And it was there that I saw my hubris. I had thought I was serving some higher calling, Champion my pa championing my patients with an attitude of, with the, towards the system of pick up a shovel or get out of my way. 
I would tell my patients how addictive behaviors were rampant in this modern society. I told them how their addictions got them a felony, and mine got me a medical degree. We would laugh, but it wasn't funny. I was addicted to work. Here I'd been teaching others how to treat addiction and doing a damn good job of it, and never recognizing, much less addressing my own. Driven by, my, by this vision, I'd been blind to my own needs. I thought I was serving life. And what I'd failed to realize is that I, too, am life. Failed to take in what I was teaching others so well, failed to collaborate, failed to balance, failed to recognize and remove my own mask. For me, at the time, there was no other joy. There was no other life. Um, and really, there was only work. So at the top of that pyramid in Teotihuacan, begging spirit for something to hold on to, I learned. One cannot serve life at the expense of life. I am more than what I do. I am human. I learned what I'd been teaching my patients all this time, that valuing all life, all joy, including my own, is the most subversive, radical, and revolutionary thing we can do. And so I started my work. And this is after like tons of therapy and going to medical school and everything. And I had to like start again, there's more. <laughs> but I started and uh, breaking my own generational cycle, healing seven generations past and seven generations forward. Re-remembering who I am and standing up my Indian, my Indiana. Work addiction is a revered, especially in medicine, in the hidden curriculum of medical education, in the realities of medical practice, and in the implicit and explicit pressures of our healthcare system. Today we're talking about evolving and I don't know if I'm evolving, but I do know this. We are called to serve. You are called to serve. I am called to serve but not at our own expense. Our passion, our calling, needs the safety and the wisdom of our grandmothers. It needs the food, the air, and the water of our joy, our peace, and our good and constant care. Physician, heal thyself. Physician, save thyself. I, I still don't know how to relinquish control. I, I still don't really know what prioritize my life means. And I still don't fully trust that I can do this and be there for my patients the way that I want to be, the way that, that I need to be, and the way that gives me joy. 
and I'm still trying to find a home in this pincha system. But I know I need to, and today I know that I'm not doing it alone. The grandmother's here, and with humility and oh, so much gratitude. I'm doing my best to listen, and uh, I'm saving myself. I think I got it, Anna. Thank you, Stanford. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, and I just want to echo thanks for the words of wisdom that we've heard so far. Um, I feel like I nodded more externally and internally than I have you know, at other conferences, just hearing you know, all the stories, all the pivots, all the you know, just amazing kind of wisdom and inspiration from Catherine. Um, and from Gina, and just really appreciate the organizers for putting together this gathering on this topic of the pivot, the evolution. Um, how do we find ourselves um, and also serve others? And this is something that I think about so very much personally, and it's also been very much part of sort of what I do with students as an educator um, in my role as Associate Vice Provost and Executive Director of the Haas Center for Public Service. Um, you know, one of the things that I love and that gives me joy is helping students find their way, think about how to match their deepest aspirations for how they want to serve the world with their own values and their own passions. Um, and so in my work um, with students thinking about how they're going to bring together their values and their skills, I found the concept of ikigai to be really valuable. And ikigai is a Japanese concept that encompasses four elements. It asks, what does the world need? What do you love? What are you good at? And then there's also a nod to the practical. Um, what can you get paid for? So there's an acknowledgment of material security, but it does really encourage us fun in, a, in a big way, I think, to align our unique blend of passions and skills and values, and to do that in a way that responds to what the world needs and transcends maybe others' notions of what success should look like. So today I want to use this Ikigai framework to talk about my own journey, which has definitely been a winding one. Um, I feel like I know how old my dream job, but it's not even something that I knew existed, let alone aimed for um, at the time that I was here doing my graduate training or let alone earlier in life as well. Um, but I do want to rewind, um, as Monica asked us to do earlier today, to really think about sort of our childhood experiences and that sort of formative vision of ourselves, um, because that, for me, is, is where a lot of this story began, is thinking a lot about what does the world need. Um, and for this, this for me, uh, is, is very personal. I grew up as the daughter of immigrants from Malaysia. They came to the United States about 50 years ago um, because of political turmoil in Malaysia, but we often went back as a child. And so my parents instilled in me many, many things. Um, like a lot of immigrants, they had this really fierce hope and belief that the world can be a better place um, that sort of moved their own emigration journey, and that's something they really passed along to us. Um, they were also um, trained as academics, and so they definitely instilled in us that love and honor for education and everything that education means. So my, my dad always used to tell me, you know, your education, the way that you think, is a thing that no one can ever take away from you. Um, so that's also something that was a thread for me growing up. And they also really asked us to think about what do we do with our education and how does it serve others and how does it poise us to respond to the needs of the world. So they had that sort of applied and justice bent as well. Um, and so I put these pictures up here because, you know, this connection to my parents, to their heritage, to our family history is something that really shaped me. Um, we went to Malaysia often to see our relatives and it gave me this really direct and visceral sense as a child about the magnitude of inequities in the world. 
Um, and like so many developing countries, Malaysia is a place where it's a, it's a study in contrast. You know, um, so you know, I've put a picture of the Petronas Towers that wasn't exactly there when I was a child. There's things like that. You could see extreme wealth, and you could also see extreme poverty. Um, and so really from a very, very early time, even as a child, you know, I started to ask the question, why is it that where you're born determines so much of your life chances, how you live, and how you thrive? And that always struck me as deeply unfair and is something that I was really passionate about thinking about. And so these early experiences are part of what led me to kind of develop this early passion for global health. Um, and that was something that developed even further um, as, uh, as I, was, I went through college and graduate school. So in college, I was really excited by sort of the nascent field of global health that was taking off around that time, around the sort of 2000s, as a field in its own right. Um, so there was a lot of work that student activists were doing to call attention to what universities could do to enhance access to essential medicines um, and call attention to neglected diseases. And I was also at Harvard, and so I had a sort of early window into the work of Partners in Health, and of course, Paul Farmer, who is such a figure and luminary in this field. Um, and the way that they talked about community need and building community capacity and just the fundamental nature of justice and health was really compelling to me and something that inspired me and made me want to be part of this field as well. So that calling, to be part of advancing health and advancing equity in communities was always so clear to me, but my challenge has been figuring out how I can contribute most effectively. Um, and so here's this sort of second piece of ikigai. What am I good at? What do I bring to the table? And I had some early experiences with biological research in high school that sparked my interest. You know, I said, I'm curious about this. I can do this. And I carried that with me into college where I majored in biochemistry. And I felt that, and I'm sure that this is also sort of some parental influence as well, um, I could be good and I could be suited at a career for research because I really enjoy thinking in terms of complex systems. I really enjoy sort of digging and looking at causes and thinking about why things are the way that they are, how they work, um, and how we can leverage that knowledge to think about more effective interventions. But as you all know, there are so many different ways when we think about health to think about the systems that are part of health. You can think about it at the molecular level and then all the way up to the health of our ecosystems and the health of our planet. And it was so honestly difficult for me to choose where to focus because I was curious about them all. Um, and this broad curiosity was reflected in my decision to pursue graduate studies in very disparate aspects of global health. I had this feeling of sort of momentum, right? I was coming out of college, I had majored in biochemistry, I'd sort of done all the things that were part of that. Um, I'd been part of a research lab, and so I said, okay, I'm gonna do my PhD work um, in an aspect of biology that's very connected to global health. Um, in infectious disease, I wanna study microbiology and immunology. So I applied to graduate programs in that field, um, and I selected Stanford, um, which has an amazing program. Um, but I also kind of knew I have these other curiosities. I like being able to think about things at different levels. Um, and so I actually deferred that PhD program to go and study at Oxford on fellowship um, international development. So that's very, very different, thinking about health policy, health of populations, um, and I did my master's research on, on tuberculosis policy in Southeast Asia um, and looking at how policy decisions were shaped by both international and also by community and local knowledge. So then, you know, but I had this feeling of, you know, I should go back to sort of my original research home. I should stick with the plan. Um, and so I came back to Stanford um, in 2005 to start my PhD in microbiology and immunology. And I worked on the parasite Toxoplasma gondii, which is related to the plasmodium parasite that causes malaria and is also an important human pathogen in its own right. And I had an amazing PI, a great cohort. Um, I loved the environment at Stanford and the spirit of innovation here. 
Um, but I also did that gut check um, that we were talking about earlier as well. And I asked myself, not only can I do this, but do I love it? Does it light me up in the morning? Will it continue to light me up 40 years from now? And I just wasn't sure that that was the case. Um, and so I said, okay, well maybe it's this focus on molecular mechanism that I'm not sure about. Maybe that's a little bit too specific for me. Um, and so I needed to figure out a pivot. And I ended up pursuing my postdoctoral training um, through a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Fellowship at Columbia University. And so this was an amazing program that took scholars from very different disciplines and asked them to think about questions in population health related to health, health disparities. Um, and I loved that time as well. Again, it sort of goes, went very much with my sort of broad curiosities. But um, I still just wasn't sure at the end of that, is this my path? Is research what I meant to do? Um, and I still felt so passionate about thinking about inequities in health. And I knew that I was you know, capable of, of doing this sort of analytical and synthetic work to think about ideas. But I also began to wonder, whether other paths might be more appropriate for me or might feed more of my own my love of what I do. Um, and so this led to my next role in which I started to think about education. Um, and, you know, because I felt like there's amazing research happening, you know, and I love talking to people who are doing it. Um, but I'm not sure that I need to be that person. But maybe I'm the person that's better suited to kind of helping those folks connect with students, helping students learn about what they can do, thinking about their own agency and power in the world. Um, and so I took a teaching role at Princeton in their global health program for undergraduate students. And I did, I felt that love and I felt that fire. Um, I loved being able to create classes and curricula that addressed all aspects of health and sort of connected them together for students. And I also loved being able to work with undergraduate students at this really kind of formative time in their lives where they were thinking about their own values and their identities and their callings. Um, and also I had the opportunity to really dig deep into experiential learning. So Princeton's global health program required students to have some kind of field or community-based experience as part of going through this certificate program. Um, and I worked with undergraduate students, you know, to prepare them for these experiences, you know, throughout, and then also to reflect and debrief and connect those experiences to their future trajectories when they came back. Um, and I really got to see how transformative these experiences were for students. And as a scientist, I appreciated that these experiences gave students a chance to kind of actively experiment with um, and explore the field in a very concrete and grounded way. They got to directly observe and kind of directly figure out, you know, what does health look like in the community context? What are the questions that I'm curious about? How can I be part of this? Um, and that really advanced their views and their understanding of the field in distinctive ways. So serendipitously, at the time that I was really kind of thinking about this, Princeton launched a new signature program in service and experiential learning, and I was called upon to build and lead it. And this program challenged Princeton students to think carefully about how their service experiences and community knowledge can inform their academic studies and how what they learn in the classroom can be applied in the world. And I loved being a connector and a catalyst for students, faculty, and our community partners. And so my role ended up growing a little bit to include broader oversight for Princeton's public service internships and fellowships. And I just continue to feel like this is the right path for me. I love thinking about experiential learning. I love thinking about how students are able to bridge the gap between theory and practice and really kind of find and hone in on their own values and passions. And as someone with really broad and wide-ranging curiosities who has always been interested in learning about different fields and thinking about the connections, how we kind of achieve interdisciplinary research, how we do interdisciplinary education, I also really loved how this sort of broad umbrella of thinking about public service and how we respond to the needs of the world 
naturally invites collaboration between different disciplines and fields. And so this preparation at Princeton, my roles there, eventually led me to where I am now, um, leading Stanford's Haas Center for Public Service. And I just started this role in July. And I feel so incredibly fortunate to be able to do work that truly feels like my ikigai, that really brings together all of the elements that I so deeply care about and ties, together, ties them together in a way that's really, really wonderful. Um, so just to share a little bit more about the Haas Center and what we do, the Haas Center advances community-engaged learning and research across Stanford, and it aims to connect students and faculty with community partners in the region and also around the world. We support a range of educational opportunities, from courses to internships to sustained volunteering to community-engaged research. And I love seeing students develop a deeper sense of empathy and civic responsibility through this work. And I love seeing them develop new skills and new habits of mind that prepare them for greater impact in the world. And I also love that this work has brought me full circle back to Stanford, which is very much a place that helped me mold how I think about the power of research and education, and also a place that invites us all to harness that power in service of the world. And so I certainly don't think that I took the most, you know, the easiest or, or the most direct path to, you know, finding my ikigai. And so I so resonated with, you know, everything that Catherine and Gina shared about just the importance of, you know, doing those gut checks. Um, and, you know, I didn't sort of dwell on this, but there were so many times that I felt that feeling of failure that Catherine shared about so many times that I worried that I was disappointing, you know, people that had invested in me, in my training, in my, you know, my mentors and my, uh, and my cohorts. And I, you know, I definitely felt all of that very strongly. But I think at the end of the day, I always tell students, you know, you, you're your expert on yourself. You know yourself the best. Um, and so kind of following your own internal compass um, will never lead you astray. And so I, um, I would have loved to hear that as a student. Um, so I love being able to share that now. Um, and I just want to thank you all so much for your attention, for the opportunity to share with you. And I'm looking forward to the discussion ahead. Good morning, everybody. I swear you get a break after this. I know it's been a lot of back-to-back -back talks, but um, let's see. There you go. So I want you to imagine something. Imagine you're starting a big new project. And I'm talking like really big, like a foundation or a company or like getting married. And you are so excited about it, you're all in. And then one day, a little voice from the future comes to you and says, hey, this thing that you're about to pour your heart and soul into for like 10 years, it's not gonna work. It's gonna <laughs> fail. And when it fails, you're gonna feel crushed, just devastated. But it's also gonna lead and make the way for some really great things. So if you knew that for sure, would you still start that big project? I know I had to ask myself that question several times in my life. Because about 10 years ago, I fell tumbling down from my first mountain. And when I got up and the dust cleared a little bit, I saw another massive mountain in front of me, what turned out to be my real mountain. And what got me going at a really difficult time was an evolving sense of purpose. So what is a second mountain? In 2019, political commentator David Brooks wrote a book called The Second Mountain. Um, and in it, he describes the first mountain, sort of your initial path in life when you're striving to get the best possible education because it seems like that's everything, and build your career, start your family. And suddenly, something really hard happens. And as you're living through that really hard thing, you really get to connect with what matters most to you. And then he argues that a key to living a meaningful and fulfilling and happy life is not found in that initial path of self-improvement, but instead in the life of service to others. And that's what he calls the second mountain. So here I am at the top of my first mountain, finishing 11 years of medical training at Stanford, negotiating for a dream job, and enjoying a seemingly perfect family life. 
And then within a year, all of it collapsed. So the dream job fell through, my marriage wasn't working, so I separated from my husband and really spent most of the time creating a safe space around my then six-year-old. We don't talk about this very often in academic forums, but life happens, even to doctors. And um, there's no work-life balance, especially not for women, because we're whole people and we live our whole lives. And so when something so earth-shattering happens in one part of your life, it's gonna have profound effects on everything else. But what I found is the academic medicine machine doesn't really have time for you to pause and process so much. The wheels will keep turning with or without you. And for me, all of this came at a really critical time of transitioning from training to independent practice. And it also kind of really limited where I could look for a job. So here I am now, slowly moving up my second mountain. So the peak of my first mountain was fulfilling a lifelong dream of becoming a doctor. I was one of those people who knew I wanted to be a doctor since I was five. And my second mountain involves working to make our healthcare more equitable. And so that work is never done, of course, and so I will actually never get to see the top. And there are many, many reasons for why we have the health disparities and inequities that we have. But one of the fundamental root causes, and the one that keeps me up at night, is the fact that people and communities that are most affected by this are not well represented among physicians, and even less so in healthcare leadership. And I have come to believe that until we have doctors who are traditionally marginalized in medicine become medical school deans and department chairs and hospital CEOs, until that happens, we're not gonna see real change. And my second mountain is to do what I can to bring that change about. But let's go back to our topic of embracing the journey. I'm gonna share with you how I got from, I don't have a pointer, sorry, from there to here. So please join me on a private tour of my little valley of despair. <laughs> Welcome. So after fellowship, I found a job in Los Angeles such that I could work there every other week and be home with my son up here every other week. And if that sounds really crazy to you, it totally was. And so my job in LA was to work at a wonderful, large, busy, academic children's hospital, PICU, four weeks out of the year. And the rest of the time, I was covering an equally wonderful, but very low volume, very low acuity, tiny little unit at a community hospital in East LA. And that part of the job gave me ample time to sit in my office and ponder what in the world was happening to my career. <laughs> and so I'm going to pause here and give you a little disclaimer. So whatever professional ups and downs I'm sharing with you, one thing that always carried me through all of them was actually taking care of patients at the bedside. When it's just you and your team and the sick kid and the worried parents and nothing else really matters, those are precious moments. And it doesn't matter if they're at a community hospital or at Stanford or on the moon. But aside from patient care, and aside from a lovely nursing team, this job was disorienting. It was not what I envisioned, it was not what I prepared for. I was physically alone most of the time, it was isolating, and I thought and felt like I was just kicked off a moving train. And at this point, if you're all wondering, what about all those years at Stanford? Didn't you learn anything? Didn't you connect with people? I was wondering the same thing. And again, I'm not talking about medical knowledge or clinical expertise. I'm talking about the hidden curriculum. Because the thing is, I started medical school here only a few years after moving to the US as a refugee. So think like no money, learning English, trying to figure out which way was up, like all of that. And finding myself in the courtyard by M104 was like the biggest dream come true for me. And I loved my classmates. And at the same time, almost immediately, I started feeling like I was falling behind, even though I was trying really hard because our classmates were building surgical robots and publishing in nature. <laughs> and they sounded to me like they already knew everything. And so I thought something was wrong with me. Spoiler alert, half the class felt the same way. But um, at that time, the 22-year-old me would have rather died than admitted this to anybody. So I did what so many would do in the situation. I figured I'm gonna put my head down, work really hard, have fun, and fake it until I become it. And so I had done just that through med school residency and two research fellowships. 
The problem is, when you operate in that mode, it really stunts your growth because things that are essential for growth, like learning from failure and exploring and making mistakes, taking chances, they don't feel like safe options. You just got to follow the straight path. And I was so preoccupied for so many years just trying to figure out what that straight path was in academic medicine, like what was expected of me, that I really neglected to pay attention to what really mattered to me. And sitting in that little office, realizing all this, realizing how much of a hidden curriculum I missed out on was really painful. And it was also really liberating. So I made a very conscious decision to stop trying to follow any path and start creating my own path. And as a result, over the next uh, you know, months and years, it led to a burst of new ideas and projects and collaborations all over the place, in, in and out of academics. And ultimately, it led me to my second mountain. Why am I telling you all this? It's not because my experience is unique, but because it's very common. It's very common for medical trainees who are first gen to college or medicine, who are foreign graduates, who took non-traditional path to medicine, who themselves come from medically underserved community, it's common for them to miss out on the hidden curriculum because God knows we mentor people who look like us and who remind us of our younger selves. And while all these people are missing out on the hidden curriculum, we're all missing out on harnessing the superpowers that come from their diverse experiences. And if we have any hope of bridging that representation gap in healthcare leadership, then just getting more diverse students to medical school is not gonna be enough. So what if there was a way to expose and demystify the hidden curriculum early and widely. In 2017, I co-founded Sample, Society of Aspiring Minority Physician Leaders. It's a mentoring community focused on increasing diversity and representation in medical leadership specifically. Um, I don't have a pointer, so bear with me. The premise is that you need to get UIM, or underrepresented in medicine physicians, up to those positions there in order to improve the health of communities here. But the thing is, getting up to those positions is really difficult. It requires years of deliberate, intentional preparation and coaching and mentorship and sponsorship. Basically, it requires mastering the hidden curriculum. And a lot of the UIM students are channeled into this path here. Become a primary care physician, go back and serve your community. And that is a noble path and it's essential if we wanna have all this other stuff here, more role models, more interest in medicine, but it's not enough. And that message can sometimes be problematic because it can steer people who otherwise may not know better at the time away from going the other way, right? And then there are like all these other barriers that we can talk about all day another time. And so what we wanted to do with Sample is to plant a seed about an alternative path and start exposing the hidden curriculum early while many students are just worried about the regular things like studying for the MCAT. But we wanted to start introducing those ideas. And uh, Sample involved several components ranging from connecting people with mentors who otherwise didn't know anybody in the medical community to creating actual tools to help with medical school and residency. But the most important one was um, raising awareness about the various leadership paths and why you should pursue them and the basic how to pursue them. And we focused on pre-meds at community colleges and other UIM students that we came across. And, you know, working on sample has been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. But what really surprised me is how much it affected my own path in leadership. So in 2017, I moved back up to the Bay Area and joined Kaiser so I could live out my high value care fantasies. And in 2020, I was appointed to be chief of the Department of Hospital Pediatrics at Kaiser and Santa Clara. And deciding whether I wanted to take on that role came with major imposter syndrome pains. But I figured one way to change the paradigm of what a department chair looks like is to become one. And if I learned anything from working on sample, it was the importance of having that seat at the table and having a platform if you really wanted to affect change. And I'm so grateful now for the opportunity to do that every day. So ranging from ensuring that everything we do, every QI and research project is examined rigorously through a health equity lens, to simply building a work environment where people 
feel safe showing up as their authentic selves. So I wanted to share with you today what I learned climbing my second mountain. First, do not let a good crisis go to waste. You're not gonna get one every day, you only get a few in your lifetime, so use it wisely. Second, creating your own path and letting go of expectations is terrifying. And it's gonna free you up to do something that really matters to you and it's gonna feel great. And finally, that when you climb a mountain and you know you're not gonna get to the top, it can feel a little daunting, but Trust the process, your sense of purpose will guide you, and you're gonna see some pretty amazing vistas along the way. Thank you.